Hello, hello, friends. Happy Wednesday. Uh, good to see all of you. I see some folks just starting to jump on. We have a few hundred folks actually joining for this session. Um, if you do me a favor before we get rolling, if you can hear us, drop a note in the chat and say, hello, Dave, I can hear you just to do a quick audio visual check. And then we will start. Give it a minute or two. Let's see. It's always it's always interesting to me who's going to be the first one to say hello. Okay. Hello, Lisa. I guess it's working. Um, all right, friends. Um, happy Wednesday. We, if you've been following along, this is our third in a series of three, third and last in a series of three, uh, as we are just doing our best to keep our friends, partners, clients, uh, and certainly team members as well, uh, up to speed uh, and, and just giving you directly from what we're hearing from the market as it relates to vaccine mandates and some of the guidance that's been issued. If you've been following along, uh, we've been doing these every two weeks. So two weeks ago today, uh, we were, our last one was, here's what we're hearing and here's what we're anticipating. And then less than 24 hours later is when it was actually released from the CMS. Um, uh, just the guidance, uh, their guidance, their interim rule has come out. And so over the last two weeks, what we've been able to do is digest it and have a lot of conversations with our uh, friends, partners, clients, healthcare organizations across the country to, to get a sense of what are folks doing, uh, making sure that we've got the the, the exact information from CMS to give to you, and also just to give you a sense of what are what's on the minds of folks that we are talking with. As always, we're here to help. Um, and so as questions come up, uh, what's been interesting is as we've done a few of these, folks are sending us questions in advance now. So we do have plenty of questions coming into today, more so than we'd be able to answer. But we just encourage you all, if we can be uh, helpful or point you in the right direction, please don't ever hesitate to reach out. With that, just uh, we'll go ahead and introduce for our third time, um, uh, Donna Thiel, our Chief Compliance Officer at Provider Trust. Um, and Donna's just done a tremendous job of staying current on what's happening in the world and making sure that we can, in bite-sized in bite, in, in, in bite time slots, we can get you the information that you need to make decisions out of it. So Donna, welcome back. Um, and let's start today with um, you know, Thursday, two weeks ago, CMS issued their interim final rule around uh, uh, vaccine mandates. Let's just start with a quick summary. What does it say? You know, that regulation applies to healthcare workers at facilities that participate in Medicare, Medicaid programs, which means it applies to about 76,000 providers and more than 17 million healthcare workers. So the scope of this is enormous. Um, I'd love for you just to Quit, let's quickly anchor to what did it say and what are the major headlines and details that were included in that two weeks ago? Sure, happy to do that. And good morning, everyone. Nice to, uh, I guess I can't technically say see you again, but uh, nice to be with you all again. Um, so like Dave said, right after we had our last uh, briefing, the regulations came out and of course, I'm sure all of you did the same and read through them, tried to figure out what's in, what's out. Um, and as Dave mentioned, it's it's really anyone relative to CMS. Let's We're gonna talk first about CMS. Um, we'll certainly talk about OSHA over here in Atish. Um, but for CMS, basically, if, if you're regulated by the Medicare conditions of participation in any way, shape or form, you fall under um, this particular interim rule. So, um, I think it's really important to remember and ask yourself, like, who am I? Do I fall within this one? Which one of the regulations do I have to fall under? The big differentiator in um, CMS rule compared to um, OSHA is that, that there are there continues to be a religious and a medical exemption, but there is not an option for um, mandatory testing. So every employee, and we'll talk a little bit about um, some of those other ancillary providers in your organizations um, who are impacted as well, um, has to be vaccinated or has to fall under one of those exemptions. So um, it, it's, it's really important to be thinking about your team and getting an understanding. Um, we know that kind of that first phase is December 6th. Um, where you have to have your processes and policies and those sorts of things. And then the regulation itself um, goes into effect um, January 4th. So um, most important, I think there is no mandatory vaccination option or optional testing as they call it as um, an opportunity versus the, the two explicit exemptions. Is that helpful, Dave? Is that kind of what you were thinking? Absolutely. Um, I think it's what, just to, just to be really clear too about folks on the phone is, is, 
what we're doing is a quick bite-sized you know time slot here but we will give you the links in the follow-up to come of the primary source so go right to it um and and see exactly if you haven't i'm assuming most folks on this phone call have read it already if you haven't we'll make sure you get it in your inbox um following the call um so i, I would i would just say you know the big the big two dates that are mentioned here is all eligible staff has received the first dose of a two dose COVID-19 vaccine or a one dose COVID-19 vaccine by December 5th. All eligible staff is fully vaccinated by January 4th are the two things that have come through in that CMS rule. And so let's move to the, con the conversation of eligibility. And we have, you know, we have some folks on the phone, even just looking at our guest list today, we have folks that are from some of the biggest health systems in the country. And we also have folks that are, you know, from urgent cares that are small and maybe, you know, 75 or 80 employees, right? Or, and maybe don't quite meet the threshold. So, and, and to full transparency, for those that know us well at Provider Trust, you know, we're navigating a lot of these challenges too, because we just hit our 100th employee. And so we're sort of right at the threshold too. And so some of these conversations are ones that we've been navigating and figuring out how that how that will materialize in our world as well. And so Donna, I wanna talk about eligibility, some of the FAQs that have come up as folks and organizations and their teams are starting to ask, to what degree does, does this apply to my organization? Yeah, great question. Um, Dave was just talking about some of the resources and there is a really good um, CMS FAQ and then a really good PowerPoint presentation from CMS that outlines who's in, who's out, and the, the PowerPoint presentation is awesome. So we'll include that in our follow-up. But again, when you think about who's in relative to CMS, it's do I fall in, do I receive Medicare monies? Do I fall under the Medicare conditions of participation? And um, in their PowerPoint, they list, you know, ambulatory surgery centers, obviously um, hospitals, community mental health services, post-acute providers, or we should be very explicit, skilled nursing facilities. One that is out when we think about that, um, is typically an assisted living facility because they're not generally receiving um, Medicare, Medicaid monies. So that group of folks, maybe using them as an example, now you're thinking about, okay, so I don't fall under CMS. You might be celebrating. Oh, thank goodness. I don't have to comply with all this. But then when you stop and look at it and you say, oh my goodness, I have more than hundred employees in my organization. Oh my goodness. Now I have to fall under the OSHA requirement. So I think, um, really looking at the four regulations, right? Last time we talked about federal contractors and federal employees. That's a small, it's, it's a huge set, but for healthcare providers, a small subset. But then really looking at CMS and OSHA um, is where you have to def define yourself, right? Who am I? What do I have to do? Um, one thing, Dave, I think um, from eligibility, perhaps might not be exactly the right term, but I think important for um, all of us to think about is when you're thinking about all of your employees, really understanding how CMS is defining not only facilities, but volunteers and other folks that are in your organization. So one of the examples that they listed that impacts many of us is um, an, a, a physician who is um, just visiting the facility, right? Providing care, but not one of your employees, like an attending physician. So if you think about like I think about in a skilled nursing facility, there's all sorts of attending physicians, right? That are in our facilities, the nurse practitioners that are affiliated with the attending physicians or the nurse practitioners that are affiliated with your medical directors. These people that may, may be contracted, may not be contracted at all, but are um, providing oversight or care within your facility. All of those folks are under your purview and accountable um, for meeting this mandate. So in addition to looking at your own employees and, and volunteers and those folks that are in your facility all the time that really you have control over, you really need to be looking outside of your organization and thinking about, oh my goodness, how am I gonna track um, that group of folks? And um, you know, <laughs> what communication am I gonna be doing between now and early December in making sure that, that I have um, a good handle on who those folks are? So I think that's a, a really important thing to point out. Um, I, I will just in a second, I will actually drop the FAQ from CMS. It's a really good one in the chat. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I, Don, I wanted to ask maybe just one follow-up question around eligibility. This has come up in our prior two uh, conversations around state law versus federal law. And wanted to just ask, you know, what, what happens if a state law prohibits vaccine mandates 
kind of how is that working? What's happening in court? What are we seeing? Um, there's been a couple of questions around, you know, has has this has the CMS rule been challenged in court? What have we seen so far? Um, I, we can we only have a couple of minutes today, so I wanted to make sure that you can go as deep as you want on that one. But I wanted to at least address that for folks listening of state versus federal law and kind of how that's playing out in a court environment. Yeah, we certainly have seen a number of challenges already. Last I checked, I think there were 26 states, but um, that number probably has changed in the last day or so since I've been looking at it. Um, certainly the Biden administration is looking to have those consolidated and um, brought to federal court. Right now, the position is that, um, that the regulation has basis and that it will stand any um, appeals. I think none of us can, can really predict that answer, but the way it's written is this federal rule will um, uh, take precedent over the state. So at this point in time, that's the information that we have. It's in the FAQs. I think um, everything that we're reading and seeing is, you know, it's here. It is, we anticipate that it will withstand legal challenges and that by taking a position of, gosh, I'm gonna wait and see, might not be in your best interest. Um, and certainly if the courts prevail in a, you know, a different fashion and overturn it, you know, kind of no harm, no foul for those that have already um, worked to get in compliance with the regulation, but a lot of risk if we choose not to um, move forward with um, preparation. Um, what does, uh, so what's been, what's been coming up, right, as major considerations for you as you've helped us, so many organizations sort of process through this, figuring out what, what, what are we looking towards um, specifically as it relates to HR and compliance, regardless of whether they're at a health system, a health plan, um, what, what, what are we hearing uh, in terms of process and kind of what, what, are, what are folks doing now and where are we skating towards? Yeah, I think that's the most important question and, and really where I think all of us should be paying, you know, kind of focusing our time. So when we look at this, the, any one of the regulations, pick whichever one you want to talk about, um, the first component of being um, compliant with the rule is policy and process and understanding your population, educating your population, making sure that um, you have consistent practices. So if I'm looking at what are my to do's right now, it's and thinking, you know, my compliance hat or HR hat, legal hat, all three of those teams need to be absolutely aligned and really need to be sitting down and thinking about what are our policies and procedures going to look like? How are we communicating to our staff? Um, in one of the articles I read the other day, um, I apologize, I don't remember if it was the chief medical officer or who it was, but at the Good Samaritan Society said, it's critical that the policy and its implementation is irreproachable because people can begin to split hairs about what counts. And I think that is so important, right? We know that there's a lot of feelings behind vaccinations and whether I should or shouldn't be vaccinated and whether anyone has the right to tell me I have to be vaccinated. But at the end of the day, as an employer, we have an obligation to be fair and consistent. So I think working between those three, those whether it's in-house counsel, outside counsel, whatever that case may be, is really making sure that you're creating a process that is fair and consistent to your employees as you're looking at making some of these um, decisions around exemptions, right? What are the things that you're going to accept as reasonable exemptions? How are you going to document that? If you're in the OSHA world over here and you just have 100 employees and you're not looking at the healthcare part and you're going to allow um, mandatory testing every seven days and let your folks come into the office, like how are you going to do that? Who's going to track it? What kind of vaccine or what kind of testing is going to be acceptable? Are you going? One of the options is to let someone on your team observe someone taking a test and doing it. Like, who in your organization are you going to put into that role? Are you just going to not allow that? And so there's there's so much to do, in my opinion, between now and the first part of, of December, just making sure that your processes are fair and equitable and really will withstand um, legal scrutiny. Because at some point, someone will probably um, present a case such that your organization wasn't fair and that you weren't um, treating me equally to other exemptions that were put forth. So I would be expending my time and energy working with my partners in HR and legal and trying to figure out what's best for my organization. I think the other caveat I would be putting out is one of the first things you're doing, and I'm sure everyone's already done, is identifying who's vaccinated in your organization. And what's that delta? How many folks are at risk? How many folks are, are we at risk of losing? And so really looking at that 
um, staffing component. I think CMS came out and said they believe that this um, mandate is actually good for everybody because they don't think that it, they think it will have a positive impact on staffing and consistency. And by changing it from just being um, skilled nursing to across the industry, that that will help. I think many of us believe that there are definitely benefits to having um, shared <laughs> the, the opportunity, I guess. But, but you have to be make really confident of what staffing is going to look like, especially in the healthcare side when you're thinking about patient care and patient safety. So um, lots of things to be working on and thinking about in, in the coming days. Yeah, that's well, that's really well said, Donna. I, I want to say that so many of the folks, even on the folks uh, on the phone today that have reached out and asked us questions are, they're so case by case, right? And they're, they are, you know, and I have this employee that type of question, or I have an employee that, um, you know, won't get the vaccine for X, Y, Z reasons. And here's sort of how we're managing that. What's your recommendation, right? And we've, we've seen a lot of uh, questions come in right that, which is I want, I think our, you know, our answer is we certainly can't address every case by case um, on a 15 minute update call. But what, what we can do is stress what Don just said, which is to say like now's the time to make sure processes are in place. Um, and that there's just incredible alignment between legal HR compliance as some of this stuff starts rolling out. Um, I have I wanted to just go back to some of what Donna said. Um, so this is this is uh, Lee Fleischer, who's the chief medical officer at CMS, uh, came out and said, I'll just read the quote from him, is um, we believe that extending the vaccination requirements to most Medicare and Medicaid certified facilities will help to stabilize the healthcare system and eliminate potential incentives for staff to migrate to different settings or across state lines. And, and the reason why I'm bringing that up as well is because so much of what we actually see and the reason why we kind of sit at the center of a lot of this stuff is we live in the world of staff migrating across state lines and changing licenses and things like that. And we've been tracking so much of this throughout the, um, the emergency declarations throughout COVID and certainly throughout these vaccine mandates as well. And at, you know that's just the next thing and where our heads are at at Provider Trust too is to say, how do we actually do that well? And will that be true? Right? Will that actually reduce some of the staffing, the staffing challenges? Would it, will it put pressure on state or federal governments as it relates to licensure or state boards? Um, that's some of the things that we're looking forward to as well as what, how does that all play? If you remember from a couple of weeks ago, we mentioned a, uh, a scenario with uh, the governor of Nebraska coming out and saying, you know, licenses from other states will be able to practice in the state of Nebraska. Um, and that's something that we're paying close attention to, especially when we hear things like this from CMS, um, if to help Will it help actually stabilize the healthcare system and reduce some of the, the issues that have been just um, uh, just inherent and ever present as it relates to staffing? Um, and so that's some of what we're hearing as well. And I know that complements what what Donna um, just outlined. Um, friends, that's all we promised. These sessions would be 15 minutes tops. Um, so that's all we have today for three of three. Um, we are going to. If you have questions, if you have um, if you have things we didn't answer, I know there's been a few that have come in. We'll hopefully get back to you one-on-one -on -one and individually uh, with some of these questions. Uh, be on the lookout for us. What we try to do is to add value and not noise. And so as things are changing in the world, we may release another series just like this. Uh, where we, we keep it real short and sweet, keep it very current and give you primary source information sort of as it's coming. And so if things evolve in the world, just be on the lookout from us. Uh, just come back to our website uh, and be on the lookout. I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll just figure out how we can be most helpful to our friends, clients, partners in the industry. And if that's doing another series of three like this, just to continue on and be helpful, uh, would love that. Um, if this has been helpful for you to pay attention to for the last uh a uh, couple of weeks, uh, six weeks or so, as we've sort of brought this information, we'd love to know that, to know if this is a helpful format to receive information. Um, and so I just would encourage you to just let us know. It, um, we think it's been helpful, but would, would, would hope for some validation from, from you all as well. So let us know. And if, if so, we'll certainly do it more. And again, keep it short, sweet, log onto a Zoom, get the information you need, jump off. Uh, it's probably a format you'll see a lot more from us. So Donna, Thank you to you uh, for being present for these last three sessions as we wrap today. And then for those listening, um, for those listening, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, 
feel free to uh, to pay attention to us and we'll, there'll be more from us and be on the lookout for all of these primary sources in your inbox sometime, uh, sometime this week.